At 0600 hours local time, several dozen Ukrainian drones crossed into Rostov Oblast on a mission designed to force a Russian helicopter into the sky. The formation flew low and loud, their gasoline engines announcing their presence to everyone in the region. Russian air defense crews scrambled to their positions, confident they knew exactly what was coming. They were wrong. The first Russian ZU-23 gunner acquired the lead drone through his reflex sight at 1,400 meters. He depressed both thumb triggers. The twin barrels fired. The first burst missed left. He corrected two mils right, a mil being one meter of adjustment per thousand meters of range. So at 1,400 meters, that correction shifted his point of aim 2.8 meters. He fired again. The second burst connected. A 23-millimeter round carries enough kinetic energy to punch through light armor. But when it hits an aluminum airframe carrying four liters of gasoline, the result is immediate. The fuel tank ruptured. The drone became aluminum confetti. Across the gun belt, five other trucks engaged simultaneously. Each ZU-23 crew worked its own sector, walking tracers into targets using the same method. Fire, observe, correct, fire. The system is simple because simple works. No radar lock required, no computer-assisted lead calculation, just a gunner, an optical sight, and 2,000 rounds per minute of combined cyclic fire. But the swarm kept coming, and that was the point. 50 kilometers south, a smaller shape held a different course entirely. The Ukrainian FP-1 drone threaded along a riverbed at 15 meters altitude, low enough that morning mist curled over its frame. While every optical sight in the gun belt tracked targets silhouetted against open sky, this drone flew beneath the horizon line. That's because the ZU-23 is an optical engagement system. Gunners acquire targets visually, which means they need contrast, an aircraft shape against sky, not terrain. The FP-1's flight path kept ground behind it from every possible angle. Even if a gunner had looked directly at the riverbed, he would have seen vegetation, water, or a shadow. The drone's gray composite skin matched all three. This is the difference between stealth and geometry. The FP-1 isn't invisible to radar or infrared. It simply never occupies a position where those sensors are looking. Within six minutes, the Russian gun belt had destroyed 11 drones. Barrel temperatures climbed toward their limits. Ammunition was running low across the belt. Gunners reported successful intercepts and requested permission for a ceasefire to reload and cool their weapons. As the Russian gunners reloaded, the FP-1 cleared the belt's coverage zone without appearing on a single optical site. Its operator, watching from a control station 40 kilometers inside Ukraine, noted the timestamp and adjusted course north. The swarm had done exactly what it was supposed to do – absorb attention, draw fire, deplete ammunition, and confirm the location of every gun truck in the belt. Ukrainian intelligence would use that data for future attacks. Meanwhile, the remaining Muggin drones pressed on. At this point in the engagement, Russian doctrine dictates what happens next. After gun trucks handle the outer wave, the Panzer batteries finish whatever leaks through. And the Panzer battery had already acquired them. The Panzer S-1's engagement radar painted the remaining drones at 6.2 kilometers. Seven airframes in a loose cluster, each one reflecting enough signal to generate a clean track. The fire control computer calculated intercept solutions for all seven simultaneously, prioritizing by range and closure rate. The turret rotated. Both 30mm autocannons elevated to the computed firing angle. The battery commander authorized weapons release. The Panzer engagement sequence operates nothing like the gun trucks. There is no human walking tracers onto target. The system's 1RS2-1E radar tracks each incoming aircraft and updates the lead solution 60 times per second, feeding continuous corrections to the gun servos. The gunner's only job is to confirm the target is hostile and press the release. The first rounds left the barrel at 960 meters per second. At that velocity, the 6.2-kilometer engagement takes just over six seconds from trigger pull to impact. But impact isn't necessary. Each 30-millimeter round carries a proximity fuse, a miniature radar that measures reflected signal strength as it closes. When return intensity spikes, indicating the round has reached minimum separation, it detonates. Passing within three meters of the burst puts the target inside the fragmentation cone. The first drone lost its tail surfaces to an airburst that detonated two meters behind it. The second took shrapnel through its fuel tank. The third simply came apart when a round detonated directly beneath its wing root. Seven targets, 19 seconds. The Panzer had expended 38 rounds. 
a mathematical efficiency that justified every ruble of its development cost. Meanwhile, the FB-1 was 8 kilometers east when the engagement ended, cruising through a shallow draw that kept terrain between its airframe and the Panzer's radar. The battery's phased array antenna is optimized for targets approaching from altitude. Its beam elevation angles are biased upward because that's where the threats come from, or so Russian doctrine assumes. A target below the radar horizon doesn't get tracked. A target with a cross-section below the software's minimum threshold gets filtered as clutter. The FP-1 meets both criteria. To the Panzer's fire control system, it doesn't exist. The Ukrainian operator adjusted heading 3 degrees north, angling toward an intercept vector that wouldn't matter for another 15 minutes. With smoke columns rising from the scattered drone impacts, the Panzer commander reported the engagement complete and updated regional air defense. Primary threat neutralized, but numerous leakers were outside his engagement envelope and still heading toward Rostov. Unknown to the drone, somewhere in the Oblast, Russia Verba Man Portable Air Defense, or MANPADS teams were already scanning the sky for leakers, anything the Panzer might have missed. And the FP-1 was about to fly directly through their engagement envelope. The surviving drones had punched through the Panzer's envelope, but they were limping. Two trailed smoke. One had lost half a wing to shrapnel and wobbled through the air on damaged control surfaces. They were no longer an effective strike package, but they were airborne, emitting, and that was exactly what Russian doctrine expected to see. Verba teams had deployed across the Oblast in anticipation of exactly this scenario. The 9K333 Verba you see here is Russia's most advanced man-portable air defense system, and its teams were positioned on rooftops, forest edges, and hilltops with clear sight lines to the west. Each gunner shouldered a launcher tube and scanned for heat signatures. They found plenty. The Verba's seeker head has a tri-band system, infrared, ultraviolet, and near-infrared. That cross-references all three channels to classify targets. This makes it far more sophisticated than older manpads like the IGLA, which rely on IR alone and can be spoofed by simple flares. Verba rejects decoys by comparing thermal signature against UV contrast and visible silhouette. If all three channels agree, the missile locks. Against a drone with a hot gasoline engine and a 4-meter wingspan backlit against morning sky, all three channels agreed immediately. The first missile streaked upward and caught a smoking drone at 1,200 meters. The second gunner engaged the wobbling drone with the damaged wing. A third team fired at what they believed was a drone but was actually a piece of falling debris still radiating residual heat. Eight kilometers southeast, the FP-1 continued its shallow approach, now threading between a tree line and a drainage canal. The Verba teams never saw it, not because their equipment failed, but because the FP-1 doesn't meet their seeker's lock requirements. The tri-band system needs three things to achieve lock. A meaningful thermal signature, a distinct silhouette with trackable edges, and a minimum angular size. The FP-1's engine produces almost no heat. Its compact airframe presents an angular size below the seeker's threshold at any range beyond 400 meters. And its flight path, low, masked, and broken by terrain, prevents the consistent tracking the seeker needs to compute a solution. One Verba gunner paused. His thermal scope had registered movement at ground level, something small, faint, hugging the terrain. He watched for three seconds. The contact didn't repeat. He dismissed it as an animal or a heat shimmer and returned to scanning the sky. The FP-1 passed through his engagement envelope without ever being classified as a threat. Above the FP-1 drone, the last drones were falling. Verba teams reported multiple successful engagements. Ammunition expenditure, 11 missiles across six teams. Remaining threats? None visible. But they were wrong. The problem with destroying a swarm is that the sky fills with debris, burning fragments, tumbling airframes, fuel fires that bloom and fade. All of it radiates across the infrared spectrum, creating a cluttered thermal picture that takes time to clear. Verba teams kept scanning. One gunner locked onto what he believed was a drone at 800 meters and fired. The missile tracked perfectly, then detonated against falling drone debris that had been tumbling since the Panzer engagement. Another team reported a fast-moving contact at low altitude. They requested authorization to engage and were told to hold fire until classification was confirmed. The contact disappeared behind a hill and never reappeared. That contact was the FP-1. The gunner had seen it for two seconds, long enough to notice, not long enough to lock.
That's because the Verbis classification algorithm computes target validity using four criteria. Flame front oscillation patterns from engine combustion, thermal gradients across the airframe, consistent silhouette tracking over time, and motion continuity along with a predictable vector. The FP-1 disrupts all four. Its motor produces no flame front. Its composite body maintains near ambient temperature. Its silhouette is too small to track reliably at range. And its terrain-hugging flight path breaks motion continuity every few seconds as it dips behind obstacles. To the Verba seeker logic, the FP-1 reads as noise, indistinguishable from the dozens of false contacts generated by the burning drone debris scattered across the Oblast. At Regional Air Defense Headquarters, the picture looked clean. Panzer, engagement complete. Verba, all visible threats neutralized. Gun belt, reloading, no new contacts. The threat board showed green across every sector. Standard operating procedure after a drone incursion now is to launch a helicopter for visual confirmation, survey the wreckage, confirm no survivors, and document the engagement for after-action review. The Russian Mi-8 crew received launch clearance at 0623 local time. The FP-1 operator saw the helicopter's rotors spin up through a gap in the tree canopy visible for barely a second on the video feed. The image flickered. Branches, rotor blur, then gone. He had a direction, but not a fix. The operator adjusted course two degrees east and reduced altitude to 12 meters, trimming the drone's altitude based on where the helicopter should be rather than where he could confirm it was. Intercept geometry was forming. The MI-8 would fly a predictable search pattern, slow and low, exactly as doctrine prescribed. The helicopter lifted off and turned west toward the debris field. The FP-1 turned to follow. But Russian Regional Command had one more card to play. The C-Lock 01 jamming system you see here came online at 0631 local time, blanketing the engagement area with broadband electronic interference. The effect was immediate. Two Muggen airframes that had somehow survived the manpad's engagement damaged, disoriented, but still transmitting loss of signal. Their autopilots, unable to maintain GPS lock or receive command updates, defaulted to pre-programmed failure modes. One entered a lazy spiral and impacted a field. The other flew straight until its fuel ran out and it glided into a tree line. Russian radio traffic filled with satisfaction. The EW bubble had worked, all drone signals suppressed. That's because the sea lock is designed to defeat exactly the kind of threat Russia expected consumer-grade drones using commercial GPS, standard FPV frequencies, and off-the-shelf data link protocols. The system floods the 1.1 to 1.6 GHz GPS bands with noise, disrupts common 2.4 and 5.8 GHz control frequencies, and blankets C2 channels with enough interference to sever the link between operator and aircraft. Against a drone running consumer-grade avionics, C-Lock is devastatingly effective. But the FP-1 is not a consumer-grade system. Its data link uses a narrow-beam, frequency-hopping protocol that shifts faster than Psylocke's sweep rate can track. The signal is encrypted, directional, and concentrated, punching through the broadband noise like a laser through fog. Where a drone broadcasts its position in all directions, the FP-1 communicates on a tight beam aimed at a single relay station. Psylocke's jamming energy spreads across the entire spectrum. The FP-1's uplink occupies a tiny, constantly shifting slice of it. The operator noticed the interference immediately. Video latency spiked from 180 milliseconds to 340. The frame rate dropped. Static flickered across the feed. He adjusted the antenna alignment on the relay station, tightening the beam toward the drone's last known position. This concentrated the transmission energy into a more narrow cone increasing signal strength at the receiver while reducing the antenna's exposure to off-axis jamming noise. Packet loss stabilized. The feed cleared. Latency dropped to 220 milliseconds. Degraded but workable. But even if the Psylock had been 10 times stronger, the FP-1 doesn't rely on GPS for terminal guidance. Its onboard inertial navigation system tracks acceleration and rotation to compute position independent of any satellite signal. For fine corrections, optical flow sensors compare frame-to-frame -frame pixel movement against the ground below, calculating drift and closure rate without external input. This would allow the Ukrainian operator to put the drone right on top of the helicopter. The FP-1 was three kilometers behind the Mi-8 now, matching its westward course, slowly closing the gap. 
The helicopter flew at 80 meters altitude, following the road network toward the nearest drone impact site. Its door gunner scanned the ground for wreckage. No one was looking behind them. The operator began his terminal approach, nursing the throttle to maintain closure without overtaking too quickly. The FP-1's control algorithm helped. It computed velocity vectors based on the last several seconds of input, predicting where the operator intended to fly and smoothing commands through the latency gap. This meant the drone flew slightly ahead of the operator's real-time perception, compensating for the 220 millisecond delay between action and observation. At this distance, timing mattered more than speed. Arriving too early in the helicopter might spot the drone. Arrive too late, and the MI-8 would complete its patrol and return to base. Misjudged by even half a second, and the FP-1 would overshoot into the door gunner's peripheral vision, a mission-ending move. He needed to be within 50 meters before the helicopter crew knew he existed. The MI-8 slowed to orbit a debris field. The FP-1 closed to 800 meters, then 600, then 400. The operator could see the main rotor now. The FP-1 emerged from below the tree line at 0647 local time, climbing at a 15-degree angle toward the MI-8's main rotor assembly. Closure rate, 12 meters per second. Distance to target, 220 meters. Time to impact, 18 seconds. The approach vector was deliberate. From directly behind and above, the FP-1 occupied the one blind spot the MI-8's crew couldn't cover. The pilots faced forward. The door gunner's PKT machine gun was mounted to cover lateral and downward arcs, threats from the side or ground. No one aboard the aircraft had eyes on the 6 o'clock high position. The FP-1 climbed through that gap like it had been designed for it. The helicopter's door gunner was looking down, studying a destroyed muggin in a field. The pilots were focused forward, preparing to orbit left toward the next debris site. No one saw the small gray shape rising from the terrain behind them. At 50 meters, the operator made his final correction, nudging the drone two degrees right to place it directly above the rotor disc. The optical flow sensors measured closure against the helicopter's body, feeding continuous updates to the flight controller. The operator's hand was steady. The algorithm handled the rest. 20 meters. Impact. The FP-1 struck the rotor mast housing just above the main rotor hub. The directed fragmentation warhead detonated on contact, driving a cone of steel fragments upward into the pitch control assembly and rotor head. The pitch links, the mechanical rods connecting the swash plate to each rotor blade, severed instantly. Without pitch authority, the blades lost collective control. Lift became asymmetric within a quarter rotation. The rotor system didn't fail gradually. One blade, no longer constrained by its pitch link, flapped beyond design limits and contacted the second blade. The collision shattered both at the root. The remaining three blades, suddenly unbalanced by the loss of two counterweights, tore free of the hub within 0.4 seconds. The MI-8 dropped from 80 meters with no rotor authority and no forward airspeed to auto-rotate. The fuselage rotated twice from residual torque before it hit the ground. The Russian layered defense system, gun trucks, Panzer, Verba, Sea Lock, had functioned exactly as designed. Every layer had engaged and had reported success. Every threat had been correct about the threat it was designed to stop. However, the drones were the distraction that made the real attack possible. Every round the Russians fired, every radar sweep they completed, every confident report they transmitted, all of it served Ukrainian objectives. The swarm's job was to make Russia believe the battle was over. The FP-1's job was to prove it had never begun. Bye for now.